shit. So and and then, but then this is so amazing. She goes as though it couldn't get worse. <laughs> yeah, right. She goes, no, I get it. Obviously, you're a big shot doctor, which is why you're buying into the big pharma lie that you can't cure cancer with <laughs> herbs and bullshit and vaginal lasers or whatever. Screed, <laughs> mm-hmm. screed. Yeah. Zach, have you considered that medical science is all bullshit? <laughs> God awful movie. 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 Welcome back to the Gamcast, where each week we sample another selection from Christian cinema because AI isn't quite there yet. I'm your host, No Illusions. Heath's going to be unable to join us this week, but sitting 900 miles to my northeast is my bad friend Eli Bosnick. Eli, how are you this fine afternoon, sir? What? I would never train the leaked llama model on our scathing scripts so that I have something to do when you die. What? That's crazy. You're paranoid, Noah. You're paranoid. Must be me. And also joining us today from the very same 900 miles to my northeast is my incredibly talented friend, Anna Bosnick. Anna, welcome back. What up? What up? I am sick as shit right now. It's going to be so good. Wait, this is going to be great. Is that because of a virus or because of this movie? Oh, a little bit of both, you know, a little oh, bit okay. of both. All it right. kind of coincided when I had to watch it. But, you know, I have a baby in the house. So one of those little disease vectors. Yep. You always have something. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, can we just mention, this is a time travel record. You remember the first episodes where my microphone was pointed at my desk and I ate through most of the record? Well, we're doing a little <laughs> flashback Friday because Anna's recording from her phone while our baby naps with a half hour break <laughs> to just wait for him to wake up. And then, you know, my computer's being run by steam this morning for some reason. It's a... Uh, it's a real throwback. Yeah, it's, you know, it's a little thrown together, a little ramshackle, if you will, a little MacGyvered. I've got a, sw- I'm being serenaded right now by a, by a going to sleep baby, hopefully. <laughs> hopefully going to sleep hopefully, baby. Yeah. And hey, if you hear that in your podcast, we're sorry. It's too, there's nothing we can I don't, do. You know I what? Don't, I don't I'm think not we should sorry. apologize Max for Max has it. a yeah, beautiful exactly. singing voice. <laughs> exactly. You're lucky. This is a bonus. So tell us, Anna, what will we be breaking down today? Oh, we watched Life Changes Everything. Colon. And can I just say, it kind of does. No, it does. It it does. (laughs) Death is way different. Yeah. (laughs) And this podcast is evidence of all the things that life changes. But so now I, I should point out, though, in case you have trouble finding this movie, that it also goes by the alternate title, Life Changes Everything, colon, Meet Zach Ryan. As though they had a fight in the goddamn writer's room. And they, this was the compromise, right? <laughs> oh, Zach Ryan. Would we could all be Zach Ryan? And Eli, how bad was this movie? Well, if you love the signs that March for Life, but you hate follow-up questions, you <laughs> will love this movie. The only way to make a worse movie is for someone to make a movie based on easy, breezy, beautiful cover girl. (laughs) I think that would be better. There would be a lot better hair, more majestic hair in that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So tiny bit of a spoiler, more of a teaser than a spoiler, but I just, I want to say to the audience in advance, stick around, stay with us here. This movie has the best final 45 seconds of any movie we've ever watched. Yeah, absolutely. Eli, am I, am I right in that? Certainly the most fuck you last 45 seconds we've ever watched. <laughs> yeah, certainly. I, I, I wanted to flip a table probably more than I've ever wanted to in my entire life. But I was laughing while I did it. So Right, right. And keep in mind, folks, that we have watched multiple movies where it turned out it was all a dream. So I was going to say, yeah, it was all a dream movies. Look at this plot and go like, come on. That's fucking dumb. <laughs> Stupid. I wish it was all a dream. <laughs> All right, so is there anything you guys want to nominate this one for being the best at being the worst at? Oh, yeah. Best worst, random horses. And I don't even talk that much about horses in my notes. I notice this, but there are a lot of fucking horses in this movie. Just like B-roll of a nice horse running through a field. Yeah. 
accelerationist horses, right? Because yeah. like, sure, at first they're like in a stall. By the end of the movie, they're eating at the diner behind the characters who <laughs> are having a conversation. It's well, and like multiple characters have horses for no fucking reason. Yeah. One of them apparently mm-hmm. inherited horses. <laughs> This movie mostly takes place in a hospital and there are a lot of horses. <laughs> Good point. All right, so I was going to go with best worst show don't tell then tell. Then Absolutely. tell. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. As though they're holding grandma's hand over and over and again in this movie. We'll see a scene where like, you know, this thing obviously just happens and then a character will walk in and say, "Huh?" That thing obviously just happened. <laughs> also, butterscotches are delicious and an excellent dessert replacement. I agree. <laughs> and I'm going to take the easy one. I'm going to go with best worst science. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's not a oh, lot. Yeah. It's not a lot. It's just pretty much one scene. But at <gasps> one point, this movie is asked what the cure for cancer is. <laughs> and... I have talked my way out of DUIs naked with a light bulb up my ass more accurately and with more proficiency than this movie does cancer cure. We'll get to it. Oh, and and then there's the scene where he has to try to sell the rest of the medical establishment on his cancer cure using the come on (laughs) method. It's just amazing. The way they think science works. Oh, Oh, it's it's just it's oh, absolutely. Well, I don't know about y'all, but I need a minute to come to grips with how meta it is to thoroughly regret watching a movie about regret. So we're going to take a quick break, but we'll be back in a hurry with all the incarnated regret that is life changes everything. Meet Zach Ryan. Hey, podcast listener. If you got a chance to listen to last week's episode, you know that we were overjoyed to be sponsored at the Seattle live show by friends of the show, Sparkle Donkey Tequila. Well, we're pleased to announce that Sparkle Donkey is running a special promotion this month, and there's never been a better chance to give them a try. That's right. This month and this month only, one out of four bottles of Sparkle Donkey tequila will actually be filled with raccoon urine. That's right, Anna. Three quarters of Sparkle Donkey tequila sold this month will be the floral creme brulee flavors you know and love. But that last quarter, hot fresh raccoon urine. But Eli, what happens if the bottle I order at the bar of my liquor store is raccoon urine? Well, then you're a lucky winner is what. Call the Sparkle Donkey hotline and say, I got the urine for a free t-shirt. Don't wait. Try Sparkle Donkey tequila today. Sparkle Donkey tequila. Drink hot piss. I think they might sue us at this point. I mean, I would sue you. (laughs) I would sue me too. They should sue us. They should probably sue you. All right, guys. Thanks for coming to the first ever writer's room meeting for Life Changes Everything, colon, Discover Zach Ryan. Um, Mm. And before anybody asks, no, I am not open to changing the title. Never mind. Okay. Anyway, so this movie is super important and challenging. It's going to make people totally rethink abortion because like, what if your baby that you were about to abort cured cancer? Uh, uh, right. Um. Sorry, but yeah. Question. Oh uh, yeah. Um. Our thing is that abortion is murder, right? Totally. Yep. Murder. Murder. Yeah. Uh. Aren't we kind of giving away the game a bit by making a movie that proposes the reason not to murder a baby is because the baby might be um useful to us personally. I don't um I don't think I understand. Well, it's like people get abortions cuz they're, you know, not ready to have kids, they have personal reasons why they're not ready for a child. I, I just feel like the very real benefit of abortion is going to outweigh the imaginary one that we're proposing. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, plus the baby could also grow up to be Hitler. Oh. So damn it. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great point. No. Oh, okay. Well, look, I think if our argument is that abortion is murdering a baby, that's mm. that's all the argument we need. Right. Okay. Yeah, no, uh, I get it. Uh, but but hypothetically, if most of us actually didn't believe that abortion was murdering a baby and this was more of a tentpole issue we used to prevent economic mobility among women of color. Oh, oh, then this per- this movie is perfect. Nice. Yeah. 
<laughs> and we're back for the breakdown. And we're going to open up on a black screen with a young woman saying, I don't want to do this. So my first note is me neither movie, but it's my job. Oh. <laughs> Actually, I, I hate to, to correct you know, but we start with mouth sounds and size over a black screen. I was very surprised that this was like not the conception, if you know what I mean. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, I wasn't expecting like the lights come on. It's the... bright. They're clothed. Yeah. There's bright daylight. <laughs> Nobody's mouth is on another person's mouth. And I was like, oh, 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 OK. Oh, all right. All right. Oh, you were expecting the mouth to be on a mouth. That's how 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 quaint. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, no, but this is we're, it's November of 1978, and and we open up on this dude trying to talk Madeline into they're at the at the parking lot of the abortion clinic, and the guy is trying to talk Madeline into getting an abortion because, of course, according to Christian movies, women only ever have abortions because some dude bullied them into it. Right. right. Yeah. And I love that his main argument for having an abortion is that they're already in the parking lot. Right. Like, we're wasting <laughs> an appointment, Madeline. We've come all the hell way downtown for nothing if you don't get this abortion. <laughs> his other argument seems to be, look, I get it. Abortion is murder, but sometimes you murder. OK. We just, yeah. <laughs> I, I just love that. She's like, we could name it Zachary. And he's like. We can't raise a child, Madeline. I'm not wearing a papoose to grad school. I can't be sharing my textbooks with a baby. Who's going to buy him little glasses and a tweed blazer with patches on the elbows? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now that's fucking adorable. There was an alternate movie in my mind and I needed it to happen. Mm -hmm. I was sorely disappointed. So, yeah. So, so we cut into the inside of the clinic waiting room. They, they come in, they're like, are you ready, Madeline? And we hear a heartbeat and it's like, oh, is it her heartbeat or the kidney beans? Oh. Hold on a second. <laughs> I'd just like to say this doctor definitely enters the room a little strong for my taste. He like slides in all a la risky business and he's like, all right, who's ready to kill this baby? Am I yeah, right? right, right. Yeah, I got jokes. I got jokes. <laughs> There's finger guns and falls. Little bits. <laughs> so, and then, so then we black out to this hilariously digitized title and we cut to the present day. Zach Ryan is narrating. I love that they went one goddamn sound away from Jack Ryan. But yeah, yep. <laughs> Zach Ryan is narrating. And he's got the banality of this writing is just incredible. He says, I've discovered that life is made up of a series of choices. That's the first like present day line of the movie. And that's the end of his thought. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Pro choices. Oh, shit. Eh? Honestly, if this movie didn't already have a post colonic, and that's the end of his thought, would have been a pretty decent <laughs> one for this film. I just love how he introduced himself as though it was a the trailer for an action movie. Yeah. My name is Zach Ryan. And I've discovered, yeah, right, no. Um, he's like, yeah, I've discovered that triangles have three corners. <laughs> so, yeah. But apparently we're going to meet him in the middle of this job interview with a new hospital. He is a professional cancer curer, right? But he got fired from his last job because I guess because he's a whistleblower, right? Because he observed some ethics violations and, and made noise about it. They're not super clear on that. Well, he says that his colleague wanted to use it before it was ready, mm -hmm. which is, I think, a bit of a, uh, a foreshadowing. Oh, yeah. yeah. Right, right. right. Yeah, I like it because he can't stop talking about how they were going to fuck up his stats by using the drug before it was ready. <laughs> right? Like he's a minor league pitcher trying to get an earlier draft. No, no, <laughs> I'm sick this game. I'm sick. I just love that there was a refrigerator that must have started to run between shooting her side of the conversation and his side of the conversation because mm -hmm. every time he speaks, he's like, oh, electric buzz trying to interrupt you. Hey, I, I'm going to get an under five if I keep doing this. <laughs> I mean, Anna, we're in a glass house where we're doing this on Zoom on your phone with iPhone headphones and our son sings himself songs in the background. I feel a little <laughs> glass house to be throwing sound-based stones. This you know what? All right, no, you make fair. a fair point. You make a fair point. And I just I have to point this out because it just it tickled the shit out of me. So the lady says, all right, you're hired. You'll be our new lab research oncologist. But the subtitles read lab research on colleges <laughs> as though his research field was higher, like institutions of higher learning. So I just I'm sorry that <laughs> cracked the fuck up. So now the, the old lady boss is going to show him around. 
and this is, of course, where I first realized, oh, my God, this is a your aborted baby may have cured cancer movie, isn't it? I just I, I, I probably slow sure the fuck to is. the realization. But this is where it occurred to me. <laughs> this is where we, also where we meet cancer Clayton as incorrigible as he is incurable. Huh? Little cute kid. OK. Yeah. Look, I know as a podcast, we've tried to move away from physical appearance jokes. <laughs> Eli, he's a cancer kid. You got it. First of all, he doesn't have cancer. In no, real he life, doesn't. So it's I fake feel cancer. he's a fake cancer. Free. Kid. And I have to talk about Clayton's ears because because it's a matter of national security. <laughs> <laughs> this child is a fruit bat. I'm 100 percent convinced he is a fruit bat. This is like the Morbius prequel or something going on here. See, I thought for the first the first time we met him, I was like, oh, he's got one of those little. Disney hats with the Mickey Mouse ears, but no, those are his. <laughs> nope, those are his ears. Yeah. Those are his ears. And they're they're insane. They're so distracting that I literally went through the notes to see what it is he said in any given scene because all my notes for any scene that Clayton is in is ears, ears, <laughs> ears. If this kid, quote unquote, grew into his ears, he's 11 feet tall right now. <laughs> that's hilarious. <laughs> well, that's a little sad because he actually ended up being like a little whippersnapper because I, I have him down as Clayton talks like Tony D on helium. Yeah. He's like, hey, mister, what you up to? What you doing? What's your bottom line like in the cancel thing? Yeah, yeah, no, the Clayton asks him Star Wars or Star Trek, he gets the answer wrong and 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 this movie doesn't know cuz it's fucking stupid. Or is it wrong? It's wrong. And and then the the they start to walk away from the kid and the boss is like uh yeah, you know that poor kid, he's got stage 3 stomach cancer. He lives here at the hospital. His whole family died in a fire and I'm like, "Oh, you want to give him a dead puppy too?" movie? I just <laughs> <laughs> maybe his bird's head fell off or something. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> See, I was thinking, who's paying for this kid's cancer treatment? A bunch of scrappy street orphans who just like <laughs> panhandle and then put it all together? Mm -hmm. Please, <laughs> sir, can I have some more chemotherapy? Yeah, I wrote in my notes, he has stage three stomach cancer. His family died in a fire. And as you can tell, he's being followed by this sad piano music. Yeah, everywhere he goes. <laughs> So, okay, so then we cut to Zach heading into a coffee shop at fucking claymation frame rates. This entire movie, for whatever reason, is it just a claymation frame rate? Yeah. Yeah. I wondered how many, the place is called La Dolce, and I wondered how many people in this movie pronounced it Le Doles. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It sounds Italian. Le Doles. Let's go. Le Doles. Le Dolce. Dolce. Yeah. <laughs> So this is where we meet the hilarious stoned love interest, McKenna. She is the barista. Oh, my God. Oh. She's a terrible barista. She's really fucking bad. There's a grumpy like other barista who's like obviously trying to like train her at her job. And I get it. Like he is grumpy and he's supposed to be mean. But like I would be mean to her, too. Ma'am, that is a cash register. That is not a POS system. Why that did she push register. so many buttons? There was no way that know. tall red eye had that many buttons to it. Mm -hmm. She was trying to find tall red eye written on a button. I guess. And she was just pushing him just in case. <laughs> yeah, she rang him up for like 19 beverages just in case. <laughs> yeah. So she gets his order and then she starts practicing her. It'll be ready. She goes like, it'll be ready soon. No, no, wait. It'll be prepared shortly. No, no. Let me try again. It's like, th th that's how bad the writer is. He's trying to do like awkward and that's what he comes up with. Right. I really wanted it to like cut to the inside of her skull where an alien is frantically pushing buttons. I have no idea how to use this fucking thing. <laughs> she blinks seven times in rapid succession too. Like, like she like she wanted us to rescue her from the movie so much so that I had to check in Morse code what she she said NIF NIF so it's probably not okay. that but I just I had to double check. <laughs> so yeah so so Zach goes home with his coffee. We see his heathishly under decorated apartment, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, this says for sure we this set decoration says a guy died in this apartment so you can use it for your movie. <laughs> <laughs> You have to move all the pictures of his kids, though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So he's sitting there. He's studying hard, you know, reading cancer cure stuff like he does. Uh huh. I wrote in my notes. He reads. He reads in the movie. Yeah, right. <laughs> but he falls asleep and he flashes back to Christmas of 1990. 
Oh, he starts sweating and then he flashes back. That guy, this guy spends a lot of time sweating. He's wet all the time. Always. Mm -hmm. Yep. He's a moist protagonist, if ever there was one. Interestingly enough, except when he jogs. But yeah, we'll get to that. <laughs> so yeah, so we, we cut to Christmas. So Silent Night is being sung, like not to us so much as at us. <laughs> it's I, I don't know. Anna is aggressive omente, a normal musical notation or whatever, because this lady, this lady seemed to be beating us about the head and shoulders <laughs> with Silent Night. Yeah. Well, definitely not a normal musical notation. <laughs> right. And, and he starts to do narration over his own dream? Yes, yes. <laughs> right? He, he says, me and mom didn't have much, but we had each other. And, and g genuine question, does anyone but people in movies say that? Like, I feel like I've always had much and it sounds like not having much really sucks yeah man it sucks i i, I can I, I speak from experience yes my wife has said that a number of times <laughs> so yeah and then we cut to him as a kid and he's gluing dominoes to the floor gluing them to of all the serial killer bullshit you could be doing Right, right. Somebody says to the director, they're like, hey, for this scene, we need him to be doing some normal Christmas activity that kids do. Any ideas? Oh, yeah, no, I've got an idea. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, it's a school time. project, though, because he calls up his mom. He's like, we need more glue so I can finish my project. Otherwise, it's not going to be ready. I see. I was I, it was certainly a project. I didn't think it was a school project because it was Christmas. But who the fuck even okay. knows? Yeah, it's less disturbing if it's a school project, right? I think it's more because he's gluing it to his own floor. Is the school going to come and like look at it in his house? No, I, I want to see that assignment being delivered just the front of the room. I don't know, kids. This Christmas, glue some dominoes to your floor. <laughs> I'm tenured, motherfuckers. <laughs> Try and stop me. Yeah, but like, and of course, the narrator's giving us all these stupid banalities. The, you know, we didn't have much, but we had a job. I was like, at this point, I was like, if some character in this movie doesn't say live, laugh, love, I'm going to be surprised, right? <laughs> right. The script is actually just a bunch of those wall signs you can buy at Michael's stapled right. together. Yeah, <laughs> yeah well, we, we cut to mom. Mom calls him, right? And we cut to mom. She's a, she's a nurse at a hospital. And the her co-worker turns to her and says, you know, there is no greater love than that of a mother to her child. And I'm like, was the writer paid by the platitude? What the fuck is going on? <laughs> He's he's sitting. He's like, no. Here, let me show you the secret to my writing. You can get the insides of all these Hallmark cards for free. You just go to CVS and write down what they say. Professionally written lines. It's the perfect crime. <laughs> so, yeah. The next thing out of her mouth is, "Happy birthday! You're a year older and a year wiser." Yes. <laughs> Wait, what? Happy anniversary. I'm so sorry. Get well soon. <laughs> Honestly, that's like the rest of the movie. So yeah, you're right, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah honestly, fair. So, okay, so we cut to mom at CVS. She's picking up some glue. She also has to buy him a Christmas journal. Yeah. Right, because she's apparently buying a Christmas present still on, I don't know, I guess this is Christmas Eve. Mm -hmm. She's buying him a journal for Christmas from CVS. This is... Yes. This is child abuse. That's some last minute shit, right? Like, I get that, that not everybody can afford very good presents, shit. but like... Yeah, I was going to say, but if the if you wait until like eight minutes before Christmas and you're just like, fuck, what do they have at the CVS that's like a Christmas present? <laughs> also, she wasn't going to stop at CVS on the way home. She was just going to come straight home, but he asked for glue. And so she stops at the CVS. Yeah. Was she just not going to have a gift for him? I Apparently. Yeah. And so she writes a note in it just in case she dies in a car accident on the way home. And then she dies in a car accident on the way home. <laughs> that's right, kids. If you don't get an abortion, you too could die in a car accident. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I also, I almost went with best worst trucking in this movie, right? Mm -hmm. We've seen a lot of moms get hit, suddenly hit by trucks, but this one is really the laziest. Like a guy very clearly just like turned on his brights for a second. They didn't even bother with the noise. Yeah, no, it they was, didn't. They didn't. Yeah. We just cut to him getting woken up by the police as a kid. And I think to myself, of course, oh, so it's his fault that she died, really, if it hadn't been for his glue and his dominoes and his bullshit. <laughs> she would have just drove home a little earlier. I'm just picturing the writers of this movie feverishly doing the math. Cured cancer minus one mom plus one sale at CVS. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so adult him wakes up all sweaty. Oh, so sweaty. And then the narrator is like, you know, I never knew my dad. My mom just said he was a guy who chose to leave. And then we cut to his dad. And of course, his dad, because he left his family and didn't decide to be a father, is 
rich as all fuck, but miserable. Oh, I just saw him walking around an empty apartment and I was like, oh, look, his dad is Heath. <laughs> See, I feel like this is like what Heath pictures, right? He's like, ah, oh, man, in 30 years, I'm going to be this incredibly hot silver fox selling my company for $500 million as opposed to, you know, eating cereal over the sink, which yes. I think is a much more accurate portrayal of. Hey, you can eat cereal over the sink at any income bracket. No, that's mm -hmm. true. That's true. Yeah. Yeah, I was just saying, I don't want to be so rich. I can't do that anymore. <laughs> so now we should also point out that the actor playing the father is maybe four and a half years older than the actor playing Zach, but they gave him gray hair. So don't worry about it. Right. Yeah, it works. So we cut to dad's doing some crunches, but then he realizes that uh, like he has a pain in his stomach, like he's got, I don't know, stomach cancer or something. Right. So we cut to him in the in the doctor's office. And of course, as he's waiting for his doctor to come in, he notices a picture of the old girlfriend. He tried to browbeat into an abortion in the movie's opening scene. Hello. OK, it's not just a picture of her. Yes, it's no. a picture of her <laughs> and him with him torn out of it. Really? Of all the pictures you probably have of your mom, you're going to choose the one she tore her ex-husband out of right. to have in your office at your oncology space. Framed in your no office. No other yes. photos of maybe you and her <laughs> over the years. No, 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 no. This nope. mystery must be solved. Jesus. Yeah. Also, are we supposed to believe that he just happened to get his birth child as his oncology doctor? Yes. This is just a fucking random coincidence. Or or maybe Jesus made it happen. Maybe that's oh right. exactly. it's a miracle. But he doesn't say anything about it, which is really fucking weird. Yeah, yeah. No, so Zach comes in and he's like, oh, I'm not your dad. What? Who said that? <laughs> it's a weird thing to say. <laughs> and Zach explains that he does have a tumor. He's like, well, we'll have to do a biopsy to see if it's cancerous. But if not, like, we don't have much of a plot here, right? So let me just... <laughs> no, well, he first says, is it cancer? And I was like, oh, is it cancer? Yeah, that's what you sound like. Oh, nee, nee, nee. <laughs> I just came to an oncologist and is it cancer? I'm an... <laughs> Look, it, look, if it was cancer, I would tell you, right? I would, I would also be part of my, you don't have to prompt me. So, so meanwhile, we, we cut to cancer Clayton and he doesn't want a shot. So Zach comes by at bedside manners the shit out of that kid, right? I don't know. Does he? I feel like he just looks him in the eyes and like, have you tried not being a little bitch? Yes. <laughs> yes. This is very clearly a non-parent, non-child knowing person's yes. version of what it's like to be good with kids. No, no, no. Let me try this. Are you chicken? Buck, buck, buck. And the kid's like, no, stab me in the eye. And he's like, see, <laughs> works every time. I'm a plug a peg a coin. <laughs> no, but this kid has been in, he's been in here for two years. Yes. With cancer. Mm -hmm. He should be fucking used to needles by now. You would think. Cancer patients get used to needles by now. Anyway. Don't they just leave a thing when you're getting chemo every fucking day? Don't they just leave a thing that they can? I don't know. Yeah. But at any rate, so so then he goes to leave and this this adorable nurse comes up to him and says, hey, you know, that was pretty awesome the way that you sort of browbeat that kid into manning up for his <laughs> shot. Would you like to come out and um have some drinks later? And he's like, no, no. Literally every female character in this movie, except for like a couple of seven year olds is desperately trying to fuck me. Um, so you're just one of them. Yeah, I wrote the moral of this movie so far is definitely don't have abortion because everybody and I do mean everybody is going to want to fuck your son. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The barista, the maid, probably his boss. The boss, yeah. The boss, even when she's trying to like yell at him and cuss him out and shit, she still is like, but but if you're DTF, I, you know, so just, I just want to put that out again. <laughs> the sexual tension is rough in there for a second. So, yeah. So late that night, he's hard at work curing cancer. And this is where we're going to meet his buddy. Now, I just a quick look behind the scenes here. One of the things that I do in this, these movies is when characters don't get names, I'll just come up with something that I can like use as a, <laughs> as, as a placeholder for that person's name. And this, and then in this instance, I use Buddy Doc, and then I can do a find and replace when they finally name the fucking character, so I can have that in my notes. They never name this character. Never name this guy. <laughs> mm -hmm. So he's just Buddy Doc through my entire goddamn. Notes. Which can I say? An unfortunate choice to make for the only person of color in your film yep. who isn't married to this character. Yeah. Jesus. So Buddy Doc comes in and he's like, oh, you're wasting your time with those bullshit reports. And he's like, oh, but, you know, you got to dig through everything to find the one percent that's true. 
which is the first indication that the writer thinks that the good doctors are the ones that don't get hung up on shit like sufficient sample size and rigorous protocols, right? <laughs> this character was written by an alcoholic mom, actually. Yes. It, you know the biggest problem right now in science is the scientists read it too much about science. You need to get a life. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had an abortion. <laughs> He's looking for the 1% of truth in all the pseudoscience, just like them YouTube researchers are. Exactly. Also, this lab, this is what Christians think a lab looks like. <laughs> mm -hmm. There is so much empty counter space. Yep. I would say, I would say it, a lab looks like the kitchen in a dorm room. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> that nobody uses. <laughs> also, at one point, he is sciencing, quote unquote. This is the first bad science we get in the film. He appears to inject a box with a hypodermic needle. Yeah, a, a PlayStation 3. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then he holds a light bulb up to it. I think that they've seen the like the cartoon light bulb come on thing and think that's an actual thing that scientists use. Like, oh, let me hold this light bulb up here and see if I have any ideas. Nope, not yet. <laughs> There's also, I, I just have to point this line out because it's so fucking stupid. He turns to the buddy doc, you know, because the buddy doc is like, you need to go out and get a life. And he's like, we're so close to synthesizing the antibody. But like <laughs> his cure that we eventually learn about will not involve an antibody <laughs> synthesized or otherwise. <laughs> synthesizing the ans antibody for cancer. The worst yes. form of measles, you know. <laughs> so, so Buddy Doc invites him to dinner and he's like, oh, are you trying to fuck me too? He's like, yeah, probably. <laughs> and he turns him down and then we get a quick curing cancer montage. He's just sweating. A lot of dripping stuff into... I just have to point out that they use the dripping dots of liquid into Petri dishes footage twice, <laughs> yes. right? They very clearly made this montage and they were like... 43 seconds. I'd love to get it to 50. I mean, they probably have to drip stuff into Petri dishes more than once. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, he's he's probably dripping a different thing this time into the same mm -hmm. Petri. It wouldn't look different. <laughs> so at the end of this, we flash back to January of 1991. This is either a, a week or a month or sometime in between uh, after his mom died. And apparently his grandpa took him in. His grandpa, who he'd never met before, took him in after her death. Yeah, and we know that he's not ready for kids because he's quote unquote unshaven. Yes. And I point this out because <laughs> much like I couldn't pay attention to any scene with Clayton in it because of his ears, what this actor attempted for stubble meant I didn't hear a single thing that he said. He looks like his beard is growing like one of those like Petri dish experiments about what's on the underside of a crock or something. It's <laughs> fucking insane. <laughs> Yeah, so he takes the kid. And this is so good, too. He takes the kid into the uh, upstairs and he's like, here, you can have your mom's old room. We haven't changed it. So it's basically just a room full of mementos of your barely cold mother. Yeah. <laughs> Enjoy. <laughs> I hope you like ponies in the color pink. And I also hope you don't like those things because I'm old timey. <laughs> yes. Yeah, he seems really upset to have his grandkid there after he kicked his own daughter out of the house. Yeah. Right. It, it, well, yeah. And he's like, uh, he's like, you you know, settle in today and tomorrow I'll see about your chores. And I'm like, oh, really? I already have chores for the um for the recently yeah. orphaned kid. What were you doing before, buddy? Yeah. Without the help around the house. Right. Right. Exactly. And then, of course, this is where he finally opens the journal for the first time that his mom gets him and he reads the note. And I expected it to be live, laugh, love. I really did. Oh, absolutely. At this point, given the banality. But it's it's almost as banal. It's like, you know, you're special or some dumb shit like that. Right. Yeah. You're going to cure cancer. <laughs> I love your brain. Yep. Yeah, that was it, essentially. So then we, we cut to dinner with Gramps. And again, in case the unshaven didn't really sell you on the he's not ready for parenthood thing, um, he also is having his dinner with a big ass bottle of Jack Daniels just next to his plate. <laughs> yes. And, and this is one of my favorite tropes in Christian movies is Christian actors who don't know how much whiskey people pour themselves because he's pouring this <laughs> like he's having a nice tall glass of iced tea. He's like, there it is. Half a bottle of Jack Daniels. <laughs> Just the thing to wet the whistle before dinner. <laughs> and then he's like, oh, are you going to say grace? Jesus. All right. I have to fucking say grace. Dear God, I fucking hate my grandchild. He is so yes. depressing. Oh, my God. <laughs> the worst. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. The grandpa, after after he says grace, he's like, 
not so impressed with what I've seen of you so far. He goes, I think the literal line is, you know, first impressions really matter. And so far, you're fucking blowing this one. You fucking <laughs> suck. <laughs> I want the kid to be like, well, you know, my first impression of you is that you abandoned your daughter for my existence. So, you know, who do you think is doing better? Me or is you? He, is, uh, yeah, right, right. Yeah. Also, my mom just died. So I got an excuse. <laughs> you're just an asshole. Yeah. yeah. But basically, so Zach goes up to cry himself to sleep. Gramp stays downstairs and drinks more Jack Daniels, right? Yeah. Oh, I, I had him sweating himself to sleep, actually. Okay, well. Yeah, the, <laughs> the kid can't do crying, so he does smoker's cough, which, you know, I appreciate it. <laughs> they literally just sprayed him in the face with the water. They like absolutely the just sprayed him in the face like he was a cat that was being naughty, yes. <laughs> so, so, yeah, so we, we cut to Gramps, and Gramps is like, audially flashing back to him kicking Madeline out of the house for getting pregnant and refusing to get. He's like, I'm a deacon. You have to get an abortion. And I'm like, that sentence has never been said. No, <laughs> never. You want to ruin my deaconship? The third lowest level of religious hierarchy <laughs> one can have. <laughs> and this is some community. I mean, I've come to expect community theater levels of acting in these things, but uh -huh. this guy might as well be throwing in a woe is me. <laughs> <laughs> whoa whoa i'm so sad well and then we cut we 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 go back upstairs to zach and we hear grandpa breaking his glass they didn't we don't see that because they didn't have glass breaking money mm -mm. Uh, in the budget here oh no they didn't even let they didn't even let him put the whiskey bottle on the hard wood he had to use a coaster for this house yes mm -hmm. yes yeah. he did your jack daniels coaster obviously <laughs> I love it. He's a fucking dejected alcoholic, but he still he still uses a fucking coaster. He's not a monster. Well, yeah, that's the hard one. Are you going to yeah. fucking ruin the hard one? Absolutely not. <laughs> so the kid comes down and he's like, are you okay? And he's like, go to bed. And Zach is like, why do you hate me? And Gramps is like, that is a great question. Anyway, sure is getting late. Good night. <laughs> yeah. Bye. Also, at one point, the guy who, let's just point out, has cut his hand open on his own booze and glass is like, are you stupid? You're acting stupid because the kid just hasn't spoken. And I'm like, oh, yeah, you're such a great conversation starter with Grace. I don't like you. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so we, we back out of the flashback. He's doing more sweaty research. And there's this, this great, damn it, I still haven't cured cancer moment that we get at the end of this scene. <laughs> yeah, he tries to throw, he has a piece of paper, he tries yes. to like throw it in anger, <laughs> yes. but it's a piece of paper, so it just kind of like gets caught in the wind and then floats gently down to the floor. It doesn't have the heft he was hoping for. You, you know when you throw a paper airplane really hard and it just loops back right around and hits you in the face? It was the that of throwing <laughs> yeah. away a piece of paper, yeah. All right, well, so far, this is just a movie about why Madeline should have definitely had an abortion. So we're going to take a second, give the movie a, a minute to regroup, uh, maybe make some halftime adjustments, but we'll be back in a flash with even more Life Changes Everything Meet Zach Ryan. Hi, I'm Eli Bosnick. And I'm Anna Bosnick. You know, it's not often that we get to give away the secrets to a happy marriage, but we're here to tell you a big one today. Mm-hmm. Plentiful non-disclosure agreement. Uh, nope, not not that one. Oh, not that one. Oh, okay. I'm talking about a good set of headphones. Oh, that one too. Absolutely. Yes, whether it's ignoring the 200th episode of a murder podcast or catching up on all those good sci-fi your husband read in high school, a good pair of headphones is key. And there's no better one-stop source for all your sound needs like Raycon. Raycon is premium audio at the perfect price point, so you can listen to what you want when you want without breaking the bank. Sure, they've got headphones, but they've also got wireless speakers, so you can listen to the Gummy Bear song with your toddler five million times a day. Oh, God, I wish it was only five million times. I love their earbud tap functions and noise isolation. And I love the awareness mode for those moments when your toddler has climbed up onto the refrigerator and is about to jump off. That's right. Go to buyraycon.com slash gam today to get 15% off your Raycon order. That's buyraycon.com slash gam. Raycon, because I do want to hear the gruesome details. Yeah, no matter how many nightmares it gives me. I'm also married. Nice. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tony D. From Tony D's house of grumpy adults who are suddenly forced to raise a child. Here at Tony D's house of grumpy adults who are suddenly forced to raise a child, we've got unexpected fathers 
grumpy grandpas, and even a befuddled sister or two. Just the characters you need to teach your audience that children teach you how to love or something. It's not clear. But that's not all. Act now and your reluctant caregiver will come with their very own bottle of sloppily poured booze for free. This sloppily poured booze is sure to get your audiences thinking, there's no way he's ready to be a parent. But he is, and that's the point. Tony D's house of adults who are suddenly forced to raise a child. Forced parenthood is wacky. And we're back for more of this shit. We're going to rejoin the action in the modern day with Zach telling his secret dad, right? Because he doesn't know yet that he does indeed have stomach cancer. Yeah, it's a strumpet tumor. Yeah, yeah, no, it's an inoperable tumor. He says, you know, six to 12 months tops untreated. Right. And then he says, I'm not saying there's no hope, but I have a drug that works 87% of the time. And I was like, hell, man, that's a lot. That's a more lot than of I'm hope. not saying there's no hope. <laughs> yeah. That's an overwhelming amount of hope. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I would have led with that and then followed up with the six to 12 months. <laughs> Yeah, right. Well, and then he's like, the the dad is like, you know, well, how soon can we start get started? And he's like, well, you want to schedule this for next? Like, right fucking now, dude, you have stomach cancer, you dumbass. So <laughs> like, maybe we're a third of the way through this fucking movie. The sooner, the better. Right. Yeah. So then we cut to dad. He's like being super pensive at his fancy penthouse apartment or, you know, what they the closest they could get to fancy penthouse apartment. Stairwell of the nicest hotel in this yeah, small exactly. town in Idaho. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and there's this, okay, so he's, he calls somebody up, right? He calls somebody on the cell phone and apparently he's like, he's like, I've decided to sell my company 500 or nothing, you know, or whatever. That's the, that's the scene we're getting. Yes. And this is one of those rare instances where having someone on the other end of the phone was a really bad idea. Yes. Because they got fucking Aunt Millie on the other end and she would not <laughs> shut up about her crab apple tree. It was just <laughs> monuments of silence. <laughs> it was monuments. And then you know that, that my cat Scampers is really running after the butterflies too. <laughs> I, I, I get it. I get it, Aunt Millie. I get it, Aunt Millie. I get it. There was almost a, hey, can I, can I, can I talk? Can I talk here now? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I also love that like Christians have this idea that like hard business is to be like, all right, you have 24 hours and then he hangs up on the guy like that. That has never worked on anyone in the history of ever. Right. Nobody has ever hung up on me. And then I've given them money ever. Not once in my whole life. That's the exact opposite. Like, have you ever been pitched anything by anyone? You know, that's the exact opposite of how you sell shit. (laughs) Right. Right. Honestly, Crazy Billionaire Remake, I just want one of these movies where someone does that for the person to call back and go, oh, did you get disconnected? Because that's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> I just, uh, signal died, right? Yeah, yeah, fucking yeah, AT&T. It would be such a weird violation of the social contract for you to just hang <laughs> up on me in the middle of a conversation. So, okay. So then we cut to Cancer Clayton. He's on the floor. Now, he's drawing a moth, but it, at first it very much looked like a pair of testicles. And I was like, oh, damn it. Michelangelo's David got another one. <laughs> yeah, see, I wrote in my notes, my God, he knows about the ears because it kind of looks like a <laughs> tiny head with two giant yeah, ears yeah, on no, it. Yeah, so. Well, he's drawing what he thinks butterflies look like. Yes. Which is not a moth. Also, also, what is with, with this kid? The, he, this filmmaker thinks children would like to just play on the floor. Yep. He has a room there are chairs. There's probably a table. He's been there for two years and there's not a fucking art table. He has the whole thing fucking, <laughs> at least he's not gluing his fucking puzzle pieces to the floor. Well, right, right. No, by the standards of this movie, this is pretty, but yeah, there's there's a, like a, a room down, like three doors down where he could go and do that. Yeah. Also, I have to point this out because like Zach comes in to talk to him and everything. And as he leaves, he goes for the hair tossle. On a bald chemo kid. And there's like, nothing, yeah. <laughs> so he just sort of gently pats him. Yeah, it's a fucking hilarious. Touches each side of his ears. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> so, so then we cut to him having a bit of food at the, I bet we could just make your house look like a restaurant set cafe, right? Oh, God, <laughs> this is sad. I don't know what Italian restaurant slash funeral home allowed them to be the restaurant of this movie, but it just gets 
darker and sad. There might as well be boxes labeled broken dreams in the background and a guy just <laughs> loading them into a dumpster. Okay, I have a theory because every single room that we enter in this in this movie that is not a hospital has the same kind of double like French doors yep. slash windows. And his apartment has it. His friend's house has it. Yep. This cafe has, I think it's just one room that they keep on moving the furniture around in. I think you might be right. Yeah. So, and then we get, and this was almost my best worst. We, we get the best worst flirtation oh my God. in the history of film. Uh, uh, are you talking about, ooh, chemotherapy? I love chemotherapy. Like, <laughs> <laughs> ma'am, do you need help? <laughs> Nothing like a little <laughs> cancer talk to really charm the ladies. Yeah, so they have this conversation, and it just keeps getting worse. She's, she's like, oh, I'm really interested in chemotherapy. He's like, oh, really? Here are all the technical cancer words that this writer knows in her row. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, this movie was like, how do you flirt over cancer? Oh, breast cancer. So he says, yeah, that works with breast cancer. I was bummed that she didn't come back with, oh, does it work with testicular cancer too? <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> blink, blink. And then we get this bizarre exchange. After a few minutes of this cancer talk, she goes, so what line of work are you in? Fucking cancer. <laughs> you think he's a recreational <laughs> chemotherapist? I did not catch that. Oh, my God. Well, and then it gets even worse because he says, well, I'm an oncologist. And she goes, oh, I guess I'm not surprised. And he says, what do you mean you're not surprised? It's like they were competing <laughs> for who could say the dumbest line. Can you not hear each other? You hear each other, right? Are you are you running each other's lines through Google Translate into like Thai and right shit? So and and then but then this is so amazing. She goes as though it couldn't get worse. Yeah, right. She goes, no, I get it. Obviously, you're a big shot doctor, which is why you're buying into the big pharma lie that you can't cure cancer with <laughs> herbs and bullshit and vaginal lasers or whatever. Green. <laughs> <laughs> Screed. Yeah. Zach, have you considered that medical science is all bullshit? <laughs> she goes, what's the success for chemo? And he's like, 50%. It's not fucking no, it's not 50%. Not <laughs> he legitimately just had a drug that made it 87% in the last fucking yeah. scene. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, but she reacts to that 50% thing like, see, 50% of the people get better from chemo and 50% of the people get better from not chemo. Yeah. So really, when you think about it, why would anyone <laughs> choose chemo? Jesus, I wanted Kara to just walk up and smack her, right? Just like show up <laughs> from off screen or something. Yeah, but apparently that's not a deal breaker. The fact that she's an impossibly stupid conspiracy theorist is not a deal breaker for him because he's like, by the way, I'm Zach. You know, I'm, a, I'm sure we'll flirt in a, again in a future scene. <laughs> I want Kara to come in and smack a bunch of people in my life, not just this yeah, guy. In no, the that's movie. fair. That's fair. <laughs> so then we cut to Zach doctoring dad some more. And he's like, you know, so how do you like the meds? And he's like, well, they're. I don't know, man, better than dying of cancer. I like I don't know what to measure this against. <laughs> Yeah, he, a little uncomfortable is what he says. And I wrote in my notes, on a scale of one to buffalo pretzel bites, how much abdominal <laughs> pain are you in right now? <laughs> he goes, this is such, the banality of this script is just amazing. The dad says, hey, Doc, you ever think about what if you made different choices in life? To which Zach says, no. No. Nope. Just straight up. I'm out. a cancer <laughs> doctor. Never, ever thought about that. <laughs> but dad just starts yammering like a fanboy at a Q&A, right? Like, he's, he, it's just like, how much time do you think doctors give you to just yammer, right? Yes. He goes, you know what they don't tell you? And I wrote in my notes as a joke that you're going to die. And then he says <laughs> that you're going to die. Yes. Yeah, he goes, you know, they always tell you to claw your way to the top, but they never tell you to spend time with your family and your loved ones. <laughs> yeah, no one's ever said that. <laughs> Meanwhile, he's seen the picture of Zach's mom. He knows who this is and he still doesn't fucking say anything. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was so painful listening to this writer try to write a like coping with my own mortality. Like it was it was the eighth grade love poem of introspection. Yeah, it's a, he might as well tell us what he did last summer and very clearly be lying. And then 
He tries to do one of those stupid platitude based, like, you know, live life to the fullest, smell a flower, climb a tree, have a baby. Right. But you know who? <laughs> One of the very few groups of people you shouldn't say that to is cancer researchers. No right. cancer researchers. Stay in you your labs. Work cancer. night and day. <laughs> you, you drive yourself into the ground with overwork, cancer researchers. You're one of the few. Well, especially if you're my <laughs> cancer doctor, right? Like you're the one who's supposed to be curing my ass. I'm not going to go in there and say you should take more vacation. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Look, if you want to convince someone to take more vacation, start with a podcast. There you go. go with a vlogger, <laughs> you know, oh. don't start at the cancer doctors. <laughs> so I, I have to share this actual line. It took me a second to transcribe this. But this is after I wrote, wow, it's the eighth grade love poem of introspection. We get this actual goddamn line. And I quote, this is the dad speaking to the doctor. You know, if I was to think about the choices I've made in life, I found out that the choices I had made have brought me to this point where I am right now. With the choices and I had made and the choices that I could have made. I wrote in my notes, is he clumsily hinting that he's a time traveler? Because I made the choices. That is <laughs> yeah. So, okay. So then we check back in with Kid Zach in April of 91. Horses! Surprise horses! horses. Yes. Yeah, this is the first of Anna's best worst. Suddenly his, his grandpa apparently has horses. Me! And this is where we're going to meet Horse Hannah, the love interest, right? Well, the this I I almost went with best worst abandoned plot <laughs> because this this plot will live and die in this one single scene. Yep, it's as though he was writing on his computer and someone who was the parent of the little girl in the scene walked in and like typed a couple of lines and was like, ha ha, put it in your script. Now you have to let my daughter in. And he was like, fuck you. And then she <laughs> died. And then she died of stomach cancer. <laughs> yeah, so so he meets this girl who's also in there in the stables taking care of her horse, I guess. <laughs> well, is it her horse? Because he runs out of the house to the stable. Right. The stable. Is it his dad's? Is it granddad's stable? So I think that his da the, his granddad also like stables this person's horse, right? Like this family's horse that okay. lives across the pond or whatever. I, that's what I got out of it. But yeah, they, they don't help you out much there. But he's looking for a chair. Yes. He, all yeah. we know is that he needs a chair. So he runs into the stable, throws out this bucket of water and sits on the bucket of water. And then she's like, you're being so noisy. Why are you <laughs> disturbing the horses by being so noisy? And not only do they not help you out by telling you who the fuck these people are <laughs> or whose horses they belong to, later in the movie, they use this barn from a different angle, hoping you won't notice, yep. which I did. And so I was like, wait, so dad now owns the barn where the little girl <laughs> died from the grandpa's? I was picturing some kind of Hills Have Eyes esque family tree in order for this movie to make any fucking sense. But yeah, it's your typical first 10 minutes of the movie, you know, meet cute. Except, as I hinted earlier, then his narration comes in and he's like, but then she fucking died of cancer. Okay, that scene's over. Okay, he says, Four years later, she died mm -hmm. of cancer. In 1995, really? With that yes. side bang, sir? <laughs> this kid has a full 2005 MySpace scenester Asian boots. <laughs> the Asian mullet. He has the Asian mullet. He, all he needs is eyeliner and a lip piercing. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah, but... I, and so we watched them like run around and point at shapes and clouds and everything. I wrote in my notes, she's going to die of stomach cancer, isn't she? And the very next scene, she dies of uh, stomach cancer. Yep. And then the narrator cuts in and he goes, you know, sometimes life makes choices for us because apparently the writer realized in retrospect that he needed to back away from that bold claim about life being a series <laughs> of choices. <laughs> So, OK, so now we're we're back to the modern day. Zach is sweaty again and he's doing his light bulb cancer cure research more. Yeah, I just love that. This is what Christians think science looks like. Yep. Like, let's let's get one of them. Them there twisty light bulbs. I, I just I just want <laughs> I just want the items that he works with to be weirder and weirder, like a turkey baster, like a test food full of ants. Yeah. Right. Just like 
<laughs> he pulls out a rubber chicken and starts banging it on something. <laughs> I just, I just need it. And better even than the weird science objects is the weird science conversation. Because this is where the boss comes in and is basically like, cure cancer faster? Yes, yeah, exactly. She says, you haven't cured a single cancer and you've been out here all week. Yeah. So- <laughs> So dumb. Oh my god! And and then we get the first of my best worst, right? Because she leaves, and then the buddy doc comes back in, and he goes, "You know, wow, you certainly have a tense relationship with the boss." That was aptly demonstrated in the previous exchange that I'm now talking about. <laughs> Character development. <laughs> I gotta, I gotta <laughs> light bulb some more cancer here. Hold on a minute. <laughs> So then we cut to Cancer Dad at the horse races. We're going to get horse some more of racing. what they think. Yes, yes, more random horses. But this is this is them taking a stab at what businessing looks like. Yeah, and it's oh yeah again. It's the exact same exchange that we heard on the phone. Yeah, but in person and with one of them pointing out how ridiculous this is to have a conversation about. Buy my company for five hundred million dollars. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Shit, we're all out of fire. Oh, man. Also, why did they have it? There's just no reason for the scene. They show the horse racing and then they take them away from that just to be in a private box, which, right. well, let's be honest, looks suspiciously like an Airbnb kitchen. Sure. And <laughs> drinking Patron. Patron tequila <laughs> straight in the glass. No ice. No nothing. Nope. Just like... Just like a healthy four fingers of Patron. Well, no, d- darling, <laughs> darling, they're fancy business people. Yes. And oh, grandma me. who wrote this movie had heard several rappers say Patron as a reference to a fancy and expensive thing. No, so they, they have a you want to get dry Patron. tequila drunk at 2 p.m. in the afternoon? <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of dry tequila drunk at 2 in the afternoon, if you're not trying Sparkle Donkey, yeah, amen, check brother. it out. <laughs> but I also I love that he's just like, you know, he's like, uh, you know, I need I want 500 million. And the guy's like, hold on a second. He's like, I'm in no mood to negotiate. It's like, well, then what the fuck is anybody even doing here? <laughs> <laughs> and then why'd you take me to the horse races? <laughs> I just you just wanted to see me in person to say a number and then poutily be silent if I didn't say yes. Honestly, this is very similar to the phone call earlier. Yeah, right. No, it's it's almost like the guy's Quite like, literally the scene hangs us up on them. Well, they, yeah. No, I was going to say that's probably what it was. Is the guy's like, no, we need to be in a situation where you can't hang up on me again, though. We need to be in person for this one. <laughs> really want him to try and do it. In per- he walks outside and slams the door. I can see you through the window, man. Oh, okay. your pants. <laughs> <laughs> so and then we get, in case you didn't really pick up on it the first time, we get another scene of him getting chewed out by his boss. This time for the purchase order. Oh, my God. The sexual tension in this one (laughs) is just beautiful. Yeah, he's he's like, oh, I needed these for my research. And she says, these are wants, not needs. And I really wanted it to be like a Nintendo Switch and some flaming hot Cheetos. (laughs) God, my boss won't let me do the PlayStations for the cancer research. God. (laughs) But instead he goes, you know what? Fire me or get off my back. I feel like you always fire a person after they say that, right? Just regardless of who it is. 100% of the time. (laughs) And then Zach takes Cancer Clayton out for a run in the park. He says, I want to find butterflies. And he's like, yeah, we can't afford butterflies. It turns out you can't just go buy them. So maybe, maybe not. 50-50 on that. They didn't have butterfly money. No, uh uh-uh. Nope. No, definitely not. <laughs> also, they're taking Clayton through a park and it's very clear that they've told him like, hey man, don't run too fast or you'll take off. Right. Like a fucking aircraft, like a personal aircraft. <laughs> so just keep the... Oh, see, now I thought it was the other way around. I thought he was trying to run faster, but the added wind resistance from his ears kept holding him back. Oh, like yeah, exactly. <laughs> like those emergency parachutes yeah, for the yeah. land speed braking records. Yeah. Exactly, mm-hmm. exactly. See, I thought he was running around very similarly to my my pug <laughs> he's just getting winded really quickly i was like oh he's taking his pet cancer patient for a walk in the park that's cute oh there you go and the, again the banality of this fucking script clayton goes i love it and zach says you love what and clayton goes life not being aborted <laughs> you know really if i was gonna if i was gonna uh, sum it up in one sentence the fact that my mom didn't kill me in in utero is is really what i love the most so. yeah <laughs> Has this kid ever been outside before? No. 
Because he's not acting like it. Right, because he he keeps saying, like, I want to see a butterfly. It's like, we've never seen a fucking butterfly. What the hell? Where are you from? Yeah. Yeah. Also, again, like, movie, you are an anti-abortion film. You are in control of your script. You don't need the person advocating being alive, the child whose cells are killing him from inside. <laughs> whose pa- whose parents <laughs> died in a tragic fire, for fuck's sake. <laughs> All right, well, I'll tell you what, this dumb fucking script just had a cancer kid say, I love being alive, so I need a minute to find those brain cells I lost upon recalling it. But before we go, let me give Act 3 the hard sell. Should Clayton's mom have aborted him and saved him the misery? Would Zach's mom have lived if she hadn't had to pick up his fucking glue? Will this movie decide that removing dad's tumor counts as an abortion? Find out the answers to these questions and more when we return for the admittedly spectacular conclusion of... Life changes everything. Meet Zach Ryan. All right. Can we move those lights over a bit this way? I'm still getting a little bit of shadow. Yeah, no, that's perfect. Perfect. Uh, Hey, Crick. Hey, what's up, Steve? I, I know I'm just the actor and you're the writer director. So feel free to ignore this. But um, are you sure these scenes between the doctor and his boss are accurate? Oh, yeah. No, trust me. I watch a lot of TV. Uh, like like medical dramas. I eat some sometimes. Uh, okay, yeah, I'm sure it's fine. Sorry, it's just <laughs> yeah, no, no problem. Uh, are, are you are you ready? Yeah, yeah, totally ready. Totally all right, ready. all right, all right. And action! Damn it, Johnson! I need cancer cured by Monday morning, or your ass is grass. Okay, see, that's what I'm talking about. Cut, cut. I'm sorry, Steve. What is what you're talking about? She wants cancer cured by Monday. Do research doctors have like deadlines like that? I I feel like they don't. Everybody has headlines, man. Otherwise, how would they get stuff done? Yeah. I I feel like there's another way to do. I, you know what? I, I don't know. It, it's fine. I'm sure it's fine. Okay. All right. Good. And action. Damn it, Johnson. I need cancer cured by Monday morning or your ass is grass. Look, boss, I'm curing cancer as fast as I can, but I need a warrant for these experiments. Warrant can't be the word in the yeah, script. That is right? the word. Warrant? That's the. It's in the script, man. Still rolling. Still rolling. Listen to me, you son of a bitch. I've seen cancer take down too many good men. So when I say you need to cure cancer by Monday, I mean I want it on my desk by Monday or you turn in your badge and your gun. Okay, why would a doctor have a gun? I don't... Maybe... Maybe he works in a school. No, yeah, that track. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we're back for still more of this shit. We're going to rejoin Zach showing up at Buddy Doc's place for dinner. This is the, where we meet his wife and his daughters, who will <laughs> never matter or appear in the film again. And he came as a surprise and didn't bring anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's even worse because he's like, he's like, well, you know, you said to come by for dinner. And he's like, well, I didn't say that today, but uh, <laughs> not, not just whenever you fucking monster. That alone, if everything else about this movie was negated, that alone is a reason why Madison should have gotten an abortion. Absolutely. Yes. And so and then and then his wife comes up and gives Zach a great big hug. And and I guess Buddy Doc thinks that the hug lasts too long. And he's just like, so you, are you two fucking or what? What's going on here? Well, yeah, everybody <laughs> wants to fuck this guy. Everybody, right, yeah, yeah. including yeah. I see. I took it as like, a, oh, are we having a threesome tonight? Like, ooh, this is good. like he was <laughs> super into it. I thought at least I don't know. Do we need to send the girls to bed early? <laughs> oh, OK. All right. All right. No, and, and this is where we meet the the like seven and nine year old daughters, and I'm like, ah, finally a female character that doesn't want to fuck Zach. So, ah, uh, uh, that's true. You know what? The the daughters are the only ones. Yeah, they're spared by not getting any lines. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> Had they been given lines, I'm sure it would have been. My goodness, I've just become post pubescent at the sight of <laughs> Zach Ryan. <laughs> Sparkle donkey tequila. So, di- so, so dinner's over and him and Buddy Doc have a, a serious conversation about the fact that it looks like they're losing their funding. He did not, in fact, cure cancer by Monday. <laughs> right? Well, I think that's honestly the reason he had time to come to dinner is because his funding was pulled. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. 
Yeah, and this is where Zach sort of repeats the like, well, I don't know, this guy who may or may not be my dad did say I should live life to the fullest and smell trees and dance on flowers. And the guy's like, oh, no, we're, we're cancer researchers. No, we we're still going to care. We're still, no, we're yeah. <laughs> We cure cancer and then we retire yeah. and we go fishing. But right now, <laughs> we have to cure cancer. Need you to focus up, Zach Ryan. <laughs> Zach's like, I think I, I think I got to leave. And and Buddy Doc is like, Are you sure you don't want this scene to serve some purpose before you do? Or no? Okay, all right. So he leaves. Uh, Buddy Doc follows him out. He goes, Hey man, are you all right? And I'm like, Have you ever known this guy to be all right? Of course not. <laughs> no, he's constantly sweating. He has some sort of sweat gland. Yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm surprised his shirt is soaking by now. And so he goes home and we watch him watch Dr. Phil. Watch Dr. <laughs> fucking Phil. Wow. Is this, this, this is where I have in my notes. Wow. This is where he's like goes full pseudoscience bullshit. He storms back to the coffee shop and screams at the waitress. Teach me your ways. <laughs> <laughs> like the scene in Ghost at the subway. Well, you know, it's the doctors, <laughs> the the prestigious doctors, they keep up with each other's work. That's right. No, saying. exactly. Yeah. Well, what's, what's amazing about that comment, Anna, is that the next scene is him at the coffee shop. I know. I thought I was, I was like, my next line is, oh, my God, I was joking. Oh, and then I'm like, oh, man, because that's not what he says. <laughs> no. no. So, but we open this scene with somebody being very mean to McKenna, the barista, he's like, this is whip in my coffee. And I said, no whip. <laughs> Make it right. Yeah, I wrote in my notes, sir, that's that's not whip. That's calm. <laughs> <laughs> There's probably some whip around it. but <laughs> <laughs> Oh, God, I live for moments. like I live for being behind somebody who's being rude to their fucking... Uh, cashier. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> but and, and by the way, I should point out, he turns around to walk away. Zach fails to slap the coffee out of that asshole's hand as he walks off. And I'm like, you are already a bad boyfriend. <laughs> He's here to flirt and he does nothing for her. He's like, yeah, sorry about that fucking bitch. Anyways, hey, girl. <laughs> hey, since you're not so good at making coffee, how about you come on over and give me some smooches? <laughs> And then, of course, I wrote in my notes and then Trump got indicted. So I stopped watching for an hour and a half. to celebrate. <laughs> I still think it's a really delayed, weird April Fool's Day prank thing. Oh, okay. All right. We'll find out. We'll bet this I'll episode it when I see comes it. out. We might know. So, yeah. So he's like, hey, you know, do, when do you get your lunch break? Can we can, can I take you out to like. I don't know, probably the restaurant you work at, you know, because that's the only set we have. <laughs> and she's mm -hmm. like, please get me out of here. <laughs> yes. I'm a terrible waitress. I wish someone would just marry me so I can just have babies for the rest of my life, please. Ah, uh, and then the, the, and we, so we watched them have lunch and this poor fucking writer has to try for normal human conversation and it's immediately creepy as shit. He's like, yeah, I see you walk home from, I watch you from the window of my work. How far do you go? I know where you live. <laughs> <laughs> she goes my notes this is the consecutive three lines in my notes it's nice to know you're watching me sometimes wrote a man for a woman to say let's talk exclusively about your wants and needs wrote a man for a woman to say <laughs> I do talk too much sometimes wrote a man for a woman to <laughs> yeah. say <laughs> yeah. yeah towards the end of the scene here she says I'm a great listener and I wrote in my notes hot take nobody who ever says that is <laughs> yeah yeah, because if they, they they would just probably be listening in that moment if they were. So then we get what I can only describe as a mansplaining montage. <laughs> I, okay, first of all, he takes his pet waitress to the garden where he took his pet cancer patient, which yep. is great. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. But I, I really wanted them to be talking about cancer this entire time. <laughs> mm -hmm. Just her with like just, it pans back in and they're like, and then and then sometimes I, like the chemo patient will lose his hair after like the third time, but not not the first time. Yeah, just her pointing at a book about the Gerson diet and then both nodding very enthusiastically. <laughs> mm, juices, you say. <laughs> oh, it turns out marijuana actually can cure your cancer. Oh, it's so weird. So why why wouldn't we know that yet? Oh, you would have thought we would have checked so many people. No, it's going to live forever. <laughs> yeah. And I, I love to, cause like they show him in like four different, like four different outfits and different date walking type places. Every single time he's explaining something to her. 
And we do that because we have to get their first kiss here. And given the audience, the intended audience of this movie, if we hadn't seen them in at least four different outfits, they would now dismiss this character as a brazen little hussy, right? Obviously. Absolutely. Yeah. Which, honestly, I kind of thought they were going to do because they did have the other love interest who never comes back, that nurse. Right. Yeah. I, mm -hmm. It's so fucking weird. But so, and by the way, I, I, I haven't pointed this out yet, but McKenna looks like Dolly tried to de-age Kirsten Dunst. She really does. Yes. Yeah, she looks super duper computer generated. <laughs> oh, and then, all right. So this, and this little montage ends with them jogging up a mountain. Okay. Running up a mountain. But this, this is amazing because, right, they climb to the top of this mountain, right? And it's obviously not meant to be like a mountain because the first line of the scene is, I try to come here a few times a week. And I was like, really? You climb a mountain a few times a week? <laughs> Like a lot. Also, not out of breath at all. And can I say no. the one scene, the one scene that he does not have a speck of sweat on him. Yes. Is after he runs up a fucking mountain. With a day pack on, no less. Yeah. A full fucking day pack. Honestly, my best worst should have been <laughs> should have been surprise sweat. Yeah, right, right. Best worst understanding of how sweat works. Yeah. So they get to the top <laughs> of this mountain. Neither of them are remotely out of breath, not a speck of sweat on either of them. And they have this talk that includes the line where he says, quote, you're very cute when you're passionate. Ugh. I, I wanted her to just push him over the ledge. I just, it was so bad. Like they were standing <laughs> right by that ledge and she could have been like, oh, you know, he slipped and he fell. And um, <laughs> Except she kind of deserves it because she says, yeah, you can't live life with a plan B. What? And I was like, and that's why she doesn't have life insurance. <laughs> <laughs> Just like Heath Enright. A lot of stuff is coming forward here. Yeah, folks. you know what? It's all coming together. Well, so I had a Heath moment here, too, because she says, I love you, Zach Ryan. And then there's like a three beat to see like if if he's going to Heath, you know, it, her on this. But no, he loves like her. Father too. Like father, like son. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so oh, speaking of which, we time jump to three months later and we rejoin Cancer Dad getting an update. Uh, apparently, the cancer drug is not working. The 87% success rate drug. Oh, and there is another surprise horse. Oh, yeah. No, you're right. There is. Yeah, no, there is another surprise horse in that montage. Yeah. So, yeah, no, no. We got to keep track here. Uh, and, and so Zach is like... Horse watch. Horse watch. <laughs> if we see six, we get a free bottle of uh, raccoon urine. You get cancer. <laughs> we get a free horse, actually. So I just I like that. I like the the life of the people who haven't like the patrons who haven't heard the ads and don't know why I went straight to raccoon urine. Oh, I thought we were just talking about raccoon urine. <laughs> <laughs> so Zach says to the cancer dad character, he's like, hey, so like that drug's not working. I do have a risky light bulb based procedure that I've been working on. Do you want to bet your life on it? Now, this will burn you from the inside out. But so the side effects might include super strength, the ability to read minds and shape shifting. Oh, and it's called adamantium kryptonite, by the way. <laughs> yeah, this, this is my best worst, yes. which I cannot believe that this was written into the script. What I believe happened is that the old guy was like, how does it work? And the young guy was like, you can improvise this man. Go on. Yeah. Improvise a cure for cancer. <laughs> it's a radio wave machine, which would be a radio, by the way. That would just be a radio. <laughs> yep, that's what we call those. It's a radio wave machine that heats metal, don't say nano, nano <laughs> particles. <laughs> and it's going to cook your cancer cells like a microwave. Yes. Does he think that cancer is metal? I did. We are inches away from Trump asking why we can't just cure COVID with bleach and sunlight, right? I did. Yeah. <laughs> so close. <laughs> This is the base that thinks bleach and sunlight is a reasonable solution. Yeah, right, right, exactly. That's who they're aiming this at. And he's like, he's like, but, you know, I don't know if I could get the funding for this because it's experimental. And Rich Cancer Dad's like, oh, I'm Rich Cancer Dad. I, I will pay for it. And he's like, right, because it's your life. That makes perfect sense. Yeah. But again, like, he doesn't understand how human medical trials were saying, like, I'll pay for it. Oh, that's great. Cool. So we'll set up like a $500 million fund, a trust. And over the next 25 years, yes. we'll start applying <laughs> for funding for those. Oh, no, I just meant 
I want to buy one cancer cure. <laughs> right. I thought medicine, I thought the medical establishment was a vending machine and you could put in a big $500 million bill <laughs> and it would spit out one cure for cancer. I'm Elon Musk. Well, luckily for you, <laughs> in this movie, that's exactly how it works. Okay. So then we cut to McKenna and Zach and Cancer Clayton all at a pizzeria together. Yeah. Right. Oh, my God. And Clayton's going to fucking break the movie here because Clayton's doing uh, Grace <laughs> yes. before their pizza. He's like, dear oh my Jesus, God. thank you for the pizza. But then he adds, to be clear, I would trade the pizza for not dying. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Jesus, please let me not die of cancer and maybe a replacement family while you're at it. And I'm like, I like how he cuts to the chase. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it's good. <laughs> I said, thank you for personally, dear Jesus, thank you for, sorry, Carla Pega Pega Corn on Helium. Yep. Dear Jesus, thank you for personally making this plain cheese pizza that definitely wasn't sitting out becoming room temperature in a box just off camera. <laughs> says the Kate Tang answer patient. Yeah. Oh, God, this pizza is so, just, <laughs> this is a gas station ass looking pizza. And here, this, oh, it such, looks a, so such gross. a small detail. Right, such a small detail, but I have to point it out. They have little fucking flimsy paper plates, which it, they're at a diner. <laughs> they're sitting at a fucking diner, which means that this diner at this point was like, you can't mess up any of our fucking plates and we're not giving you any real food. Bring your own gas station ass <laughs> pizza. <laughs> yep, 100%. <laughs> yeah, the cheese looks like it is is hard at this point. Oh, it's yeah. It's fucking gross. No, no, it's it's made out of the miners we didn't give jobs to after the 19th <laughs> oh, century. Oh, God. <laughs> also, I just have to point this out that they, they cut from there to like a, a fire, the dad in the fire pit. This scene doesn't matter and it doesn't do anything. Bible reading montage. Yeah. And like three more horses, by the way. Yeah. Except that he's, of course, we need to keep up horse watch. He's reading the Bible by the fire, but for some reason, the camera guy appears to be slowly sinking into the ground. Why? I don't. <laughs> was that an artistic <laughs> choice or was the tripod falling? I don't know. It really <laughs> feels like the Try, you know when you get those ones that have like the little cushions in them so that they lower slowly instead of breaking your camera? Yeah. <laughs> it really feels like the guy was like, you know, that's actually pretty artsy. You want to keep that shit? See, I thought the cameraman was slowly sneaking out of the, out of the movie. Oh, that makes sense. <laughs> He's just trying to do that thing where you like turn into a bit of like a... a like a, you melt like a fucking slug and try to like just yeah, roll yeah. yourself out. <laughs> <laughs> So, but yeah, but he's reading the Bible. He's thinking about life. He still has the picture of him and Madeline together that the yeah. one that, that Zach has the ripped half of. He has the full picture. He has the other half of the amulet. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. So, so we cut to, to Cancer Dad at his next appointment. And he's like, hey, look, Doc, who I've known now for three and a half months, I have a reveal. I mean, a story, right? It's not about you. Th yeah. So <laughs> hypothetically... Hypothetically, I'm your dad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but he beats around the bush to get there once again, causing me to write like, how much shooting the shit time do they think doctors give you? Yeah. And then Zach, he finishes this very blatant, I'm your dad. And he goes, what are you trying to tell me? And I wrote my notes. What the fuck do you think he's trying to tell you, man? See, I thought this was them getting back to the Star Wars reference from earlier. Because it's four times like, <laughs> Zach, Zach, I am I your am father. Your father. <laughs> no! <laughs> Yeah, well, now, in Zach's defense, the two actors are essentially the same age, so I get why he's surprised yeah, by no. this. And honestly, him not believing the dad for way too long was super fucking funny. Yes. Like, by the end of the scene, he might as well have his ears covered and be like, la, la, la. But it's actually better than that. When he tells him, this is a cancer appointment, he tells him, and he's like, get out of here. I'm not going to cure your cancer. I wrote my notes. <laughs> get, go on, get. Yeah, I feel yes. like there's probably some kind of ethics violation. But also, what the fuck is Cancer Dad thinking, right? He's like, he's like, anyway, so I'm the deadbeat dad who left you and uh, never entered your life in any way. Anyway, good luck saving my life um, with your experimental treatment. <laughs> so, 
okay, so now he goes to McKenna's place to see if there's any way they can resolve this entire plot in 15 fucking minutes. Yeah. Right? Apparently it's Christmas now. Yeah. I really, really wanted him to turn out to be her dad, too. <laughs> so- <laughs> Well, given the way this movie's unfolding so far, yeah. I yeah. I wanted I wanted him to be like my patient is my dad. Can you even imagine having such a weird and appropriate relationship with your doctor? Says the man who often takes his cancer patients out for pizza with his girlfriend. Yeah, right, right, yeah, yeah exactly. And will adopt him before the end of the movie. And the fact that she didn't just say fucking what after that. Yeah. And McKenna's advice here is so insane. She basically says, and correct me if I'm wrong here. She's like, look, I know you're upset. But you need to get over it immediately. Yes. Like right. Now. <laughs> right now. She says, in fact, you can't blame him for a mistake he made 34 years ago. I'm like, he's been making the. It's not a discreet mistake that he made <laughs> once. Right. He's been making the same mistake continuously for 34 fucking years. Like three months ago, he knew this shit. At least. Yeah. And she she explains how like Jesus on the cross said, forgive them, father. They know what know not what they do. And like, there's two <laughs> angles to that. First of all, Jesus is very clearly doing a, oh, if my dad knew about this, he would beat you guys yeah, up right, thing yes. in the Bible, right? Yeah. It's not admirable. And two, he, he did know what he was doing. <laughs> like, it's not a... Well, and also... In three of the four Gospels, he actually says something different. So. Yeah. <laughs> sure. I, see, I thought she was saying, if you think about it, God abandoned you and your mom long before you were abandoned by your dad. Oh, yeah. interesting. So, <laughs> so. Have, you, have you considered being mad at the Heavenly Father? Well, it's so funny because like out of no, like we've had a little Bible reading montage. We've had everybody says says grace and shit, but out of nowhere, she just Jesus is it up. Yeah. Yeah. Right. As as though they like they found out like three days before they were done filming that whatever Dove Foundation recommends movies based on how many times the word Christ is used. (laughs) (laughs) Guy comes in for this day of shooting. Guys, I've got some bad news. Um. This is going to have to be a Christian movie. So today's scene is just going to be real weird. <laughs> real, real weird. Yeah. She's hard at work justifying the gam inclusion, but also like with let, let's just acknowledge with terrible advice, right? Her advice is you have to forgive and love the people that hurt you the most. No, the fuck yes. you don't. Yeah. No. In fact, those are the people you should forgive the least. Right, right. That should be the last on your list of people to forgive. That's how badness works. Christ teaches real love, Zach. Christ teaches real mm. love, Zach. You just cure stupid cancer. <laughs> like, what do you know about it? <laughs> With your coin flip chemotherapy. Yeah, right. <laughs> And of course, they end this conversation with him going, you're right. I should forgive my dad and hurry the fuck up before the credits show up. And then we get a big romantic hug between the two of them. Yeah. (laughs) And now it's time for honestly what I thought you were talking about, Eli, when you when you did your best worst. It's time for the part where he has to go in front of the ethics board to pitch his cancer curing nano radio technology. Right. And I I would like to say, because, you know, we've said a lot of mean things about this movie. I think it's really cool that they let me and Noah write the lines for the members of the board for this scene. (laughs) Oh, my God. So we get we we open the scene with him going like, yeah, and that's how I'm going to cure cancer. And the board lady's objection is she says, well, nothing you've shown us demonstrates that your machine can distinguish between cancer cells and healthy tissue. Nothing he's shown them. That's a pretty big fucking problem. He's like, I'm just going to randomly zap shit and hope to get the cancer. <laughs> and he just yells, let me put my dad in a microwave. Yes, yes his answer is, er, um, well, sheesh. Yeah. <laughs> he, he goes from zero to 100 on this hospital board instantly. Yes. Yeah. The whole movie is about what like a controlled, thoughtful person he is. And she's like, cool. So you know how to point your cancer gun, right? And he's like, you fat bitch. I'll kill you with my bare hands. Fight me in the parking lot right now. (laughs) He screams, look at the data. Look at it. And I'm just like, right, but she just said that you can't tell which is which. (laughs) And the best part is, it's not even like they're like, no, you can't have your special cancer microwave. They want him to spend a year on tests. And he's like, I don't have a year. And I wrote in my notes to cure cancer. (laughs) Yes. 
Right, yeah. Can you imagine working your entire adult life to cure cancer and then quitting because you have to do it longer? Right. (laughs) Jesus. Well, of course, but this is the movie version of him getting shut down by big oncology, right? The idea in the writer's head is that this board is just going to forever delay it so because, you know, they're raking in all that sweet cancer money and they don't want the cure to get out. Of course. Oh, sure. So he he storms off. He's quitting, goddammit. He's going to cure his cancer on himself with fucking blackjack and hookers or whatever. <laughs> and he so, and and boss lady follows behind him yelling at him. And once again, I have to present the actual exchange. It's so incredibly stupid. Oh, it's the best. He says, my treatment is safe and it's viable. And you know that. She says, oh, no, not entirely. And you know it. And he says, don't give me that. You know it's safe. And you know dot, dot, dot. And she says, don't tell me what I know, kid. <laughs> you know, and then I just wanted them to start making out because this is where the <laughs> sexual attention, <laughs> sexual attention <laughs> finally explodes. <laughs> <It's so dumb. laughs> All right. And then, and then we get a horse. <laughs> Yep. I know. Okay. Fucking horse. So again, this is my favorite horse. Cancer Dad now gets up from the fire pit where he was studying the Bible and goes to the barn where childhood Zach was. Now, I, I want to be clear. The movie wants us to think this is a different building. Yes. It's just not. So I was like, do they live in the same place and not know? What the <laughs> fuck is happening? <laughs> Also, by the way, the camera at work and this scene where Zach comes to visit dad, it's like the cameraman was on a shoddily maintained carnival ride. Mm-hmm. It yeah. was just nauseous. Yeah. All my notes here, just all caps, put the goddamn camera on a goddamn tripod. Maybe that's the thing. The <laughs> tripod melted in that last scene and said, so they're like, well, you have to hold it now. You, <laughs> your dumbass put it in the fire last time. <laughs> So, but, but Zach's there to break the news. He says, Hey man, the board is not going to let me cure your cancer because I can't do it safely. And he's like, Oh, can you just like, you know, can we just do it underground? And he's like, you know what? Do it anyway. I I can do exactly that. I might lose my license, but damn it. I'm going to cure your cancer one way or the other. Even if it means this cancer cure gets destroyed and no one else gets their cancer (laughs) cured. I'm going to do it to you because you're the man who knocked up my mom and left her in poverty and desolation. Yes, right. This film thinks that cancer hasn't been cured yet because there aren't any maverick scientists out there who go against the odds. Absolutely. No, that is absolutely what we're supposed to be thinking in this scene, right? We're supposed to sympathize with McKenna's worldview at this point. Jesus. And then the writer reveals themselves to be under the age of 35 because the dad has this line of like, look at me, even if you cure my cancer, I'm still old. I mean, aren't we useless people at this point? Oh, my more or less? God. No, see, this is the part of the movie I understood and agreed with. I actually <laughs> it's super important. <laughs> he goes, Eli, we're middle aged now. Yes. No, yeah, you are. No, you you're see. assuming I'm going to live. I was called a middle aged woman. Last year by my dentist. Oh, right. But and I was like, so- darling, middle aged implies that I'm not 95% of the way there. So, okay, you know, right. for me, <laughs> you're making it depressing now, Eli. Damn it. I'm in dog. Years. This is my least favorite joke that Eli does. <laughs> People are listening back through the archives now and they're like, he knew it's trust me. It's good. Noah. Noah, will you tell Eli to stop making these? <laughs> I, I, well, I say I'm going to die. I'm going to die jokes. Yeah. And OK. And also tell him that I'm not speaking to him anymore. You don't even know how many horses are in this movie. <laughs> and speaking... I know exactly how many horses there are in this movie. Thank you very much. How did you like Cam this week? Well, they just had a <laughs> weird, messy couples fight and then <laughs> Noah turned off the records. <laughs> yeah, this, no, nobody's going to hear that. <laughs> and speaking of being at death's door, this is where the dad says to Zach, he's like, you know, when you're at death's door, faith is, is more appealing and I'm like, yeah, do you guys think that that's evidence that it's true or that it's not true? Like, seriously, why are you bringing that up? I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but having a gun to your head really opens you up to the person holding the gun. <laughs> yeah. right. So he's like, so he's like, Zach, can we pray together? And of course, he fails to say, OK, but we have to sit back to back. So fuck him. <laughs> but the dad prays and he goes, he, he starts off by going like, Jesus, I'm sorry for look at all the stuff that I ever all did. Just every <laughs> fucking, you Just know. Just all of it. You know. Mm-hmm. And then he adds, he goes, 
also please help Zach to forgive me. Zach interrupts him mid prayer and says, oh, no, I, I forgive you. I actually, I already have forgiven you. And he goes, oh, never mind on that. Let's like, cross that one off, G- Jesus, of your list, I guess. <laughs> oh, shit. Okay, well, you know what? Since that one's done, I'd like the Broncos to have a better uh, sort of roster this year. I've got a couple of a couple of draft picks I'd love for them to get, Jesus, if you're listening. Yes, baby Jesus, please, please let Zach go ham on my insides with a twisty light bulb. Yes, <laughs> this also, <laughs> while we're on the subject. So, okay. So then we cut to Zach giving dad his cancer radio nano monoatomic gold treatment, right? Yeah. You need to be under a giant stand mixer. Also, you need to wear a high hospital gown, but it's okay if you wear your grimy sweats from the street and your shoes, by the way. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> they're like, could you change into this hospital gown? And the actor was like, fuck you. And they're like, fair, fair. But also, like, I have no idea what this machine was, but I feel like it was real medical equipment that was being used to make this movie instead of cure someone of a disease. So I was super duper upset. Yeah, I want to find out where this movie was made and be like, hey, if your CAT scan appointment was delayed in the spring of 2017, here are the people you should kick in the balls. I think it was one of those like like 3D X-ray things. Okay, all right. Because I've been in something like that. Interesting. It was not wasn't completely like that, but it looked very similar. Braggy. Still kind of pissed. Um, All, or that, or it was a mammogram thing without the like little, like, like pinchy part of it. Okay. Because I, that's definitely what they look like. Wait, darling, I actually don't know this. Does the mammogram machine squoosh your tit and then twist it? No. So it, you know how, like when you're, when you're going into an elevator and the door closes on your arm, they basically yes. kind of do that, but they don't open it back up on your tit. And then like this thing goes like around it. <laughs> So it's like squished, but then there's like a sure, 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 sure thing going around it. And then they have to do it at a different angle. This is why Donald James Parker thinks it's fake. <laughs> <laughs> so, and by the way, then we deal with the whole, and yes, he did cure cancer thing, like basically with newspaper spinning <laughs> into the frame. Okay, but newspaper as created by like yes. an AI that was trained for <laughs> half a set, right? Because the magazine titles are like, News yes. magazine, America magazine, Zork Weekly. <laughs> Don't abort your babies because this one cured cancer. The magazine. No, apparently the fucking cure for cancer, the story about the cure for cancer broke on Channel 24 News out of Charlotte, North Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> so. But yeah, but at any rate, so the, the news comes up and it says, and then he did cure cancer. I wanted one of the magazines to be Horse Weekly. Oh, fuck yes. yeah. God damn it. Horse Digest at least. <laughs> the caption's just I was there the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> no, the caption is nay, 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 nay. <laughs> cancer. And so, and then we get a very quick scene where he proposes to McKenna. And again, because of my best worst, they're like, you know, they show him like he kneels down and he opens his hand. He's got the ring in there and everything. And then the music cuts out for him to go, will you marry me? Just in case people didn't figure out what that custom meant otherwise. (laughs) So fucking dumb. But yes, she will marry him. And then, oh, we have to wrap up Cancer Clayton. Well, he's not Cancer Clayton anymore. He's just regular Clayton because Zach cured cancer. He has <laughs> hair. Yeah, exactly. Now, he couldn't do anything about those ears, unfortunately. That'll be his next project, I yeah. guess. If I can say here, I'm going to need you guys to carry me and tell me what happened during this scene because my notes are in order. They're going to adopt Big Ear Kid, aren't they? Jesus, those fucking ears are huge. Ears, 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 ears. Did they adopt him? I literally couldn't hear or see anything they said because of the ears. Yeah, no, the scene really <laughs> did hide behind his ears. But yes, that's it. They're, they're like, do you want to be our kid now? And he's like, yay, hooray for me living and having a family. Yeah. And so, okay. So we've got one final scene. You think that you know. Oh, my God everything that's going to happen here, but no, it's about to change on you. It's about to do a little quick twist, a little flip. So we go out to see cancer dad and he's like, Oh, Hey, you know, you got, you're getting married to McKenna. That's great. You could get married on my big giant rich guy estate. Well, no, first he says, did she say yes? And then before he has a chance to answer, he says, of course she says yes. Cause everybody wants to fuck you. Even Every your fucking single dad. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> And he's like, you can get married here. And he goes to shake Zach's hand, except 
there is no Zach. What? <laughs> he was just imagining what his abortus fetus from 1978 could have been. <laughs> so, okay. Here's my question, because we're, we're about to get a shot of the clinic back in 1978. Is this movie the imaginings of a teenager whose girlfriend is about to get an abortion or an old man fantasizing about the son he would have had? They're both insane, but I'd right, like to know like, which we think it is. One way or the other, he imagined the kid into a tragic backstory with a dead mom and an alcoholic uh, absentee grandpa. Why would you add all that? And the just a bunch of unnecessary horses and like a lost love due to like cancer and like a really blinky waitress. Yeah. I really wanted him to turn to the girlfriend and be like, no, you'll die on the way home from CVS. <laughs> what? No. I think this was actually the girlfriend's fantasy. And she's like, yeah, that sounds dumb. And then she goes yeah, right. and gets no, the that's abortion. How they, it doesn't work out well for me at all. <laughs> so, so we go all the way back. Yeah, we, we back to 1978 at the abortion clinic and, the, and she goes through with it. She's like, yeah, you know, flashback of a movie or cure cancer, whatever. I'm going to get the abortion anyway, which is good because like, honestly, <laughs> If she hadn't, and then the kid hadn't cured cancer, they'd have been disappointed. Like that kid that was like set up for failure. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Oh, you uh, you got a job at Boscov's, huh? No, that's, hmm. that's Boscov's. Hmm. <laughs> not uh, not the fugue state your father was in when we were seventeen, but no, Boscov's is fine. No, cool. that's good. That's great. Good for you. So, and then the narrator cuts in and he goes, "My name would have been Zach Ryan, and I, and I probably would have cured cancer." But my mommy aborted me. I like. I was like, if the producer credit in this fucking movie is not Eli's Irish abortion clinic lady voice, I will be surprised. <laughs> Just a sock puppet in a director's cap turns around to face the camera. <laughs> and then it gives the name of the aborted fetus. It's like, in memory of a fetus that we retroactively named. That probably oh, would have cured okay. cancer. <laughs> relax man we get it like you, your third divorce and your fourth wife was like you should come to church with me and you were like I gotta make a movie about that baby aborted and no one stopped you because you live in America <laughs> alright so now it seems like it would be obvious but given the fact that like clearly Madeline's life is better with the divorce I, I'm just I'm curious what, what you guys think the moral of this story was Heath's gonna die of stomach cancer oh Jesus Christ <laughs> I, I <laughs> horses cause cancer. Oh, Ooh, interesting. Yeah. Cause like they're, they're often the two are never to be uh, never apart in these Christian movies, you know? No, you're right. Never the twain shall. Yeah. It should be whatever the opposite of meat is. No horses cause cancer. Um, okay. <laughs> all right. Interesting. I thought it was, if your kid doesn't cure cancer, you probably should have aborted them. So Ooh, oh, yeah. no, that's, oh, I that's like that it. One. We found it. We found, we found it. it. Yeah. All right. Well, Anna, thank you so much for suffering alongside us once again. I know it wasn't the easiest record ever, but it's always great to have you on. It's always fun to be here. That sounded super duper convincing. And of course, if the <laughs> listeners want to hear more from you, uh, they should definitely check out D&D Minus. But also you've got an incredible album that they could check out as well. Remind me where they should go to find that. Oh, yeah. Anywhere. There's, there's streaming services. Sur streaming services. Awesome. Yep. That's the word. <laughs> anyway, anywhere you get your streaming streaming music, it's called The Ring by Anna Bosnick. Right. But don't Google The Ring because then you get the movie. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Sure. Sure. I, I wrote a, an album about a creepy girl who comes out of a well. Uh, yes. No. <laughs> but, you know, it's a lot of fun. I also really enjoy doing D&D Minus, so highly recommend that show. And I did the music for it. So, you know. Fuck yeah. She did do the music. I don't know if you've noticed the credits, but she did the music. I yeah, did the music yeah. right, right there in the credits. <laughs> Eli just doesn't say it to anybody on the thing. So you have to go look for it in the credits. Anyway. <laughs> All right. Well, I guess that's going to do it for a review of Life Changes Everything. Meet Zach Ryan. That's not going to do it, though, for the episode just yet, because we still need to return to first positions for the next one. So, Eli, tell us what's on deck. Well, Noah, next week is Easter. And so in the very... Christian Eastery spirit Christian will be watching the 1972 creature feature Night of the Lepus. 
Uh, oh, okay. Well, actually, no. In this instance, I am 100% down for... <laughs> for rabbits, <laughs> Easter, Christian. Yeah, counts. no, that, that counts. That counts. Absolutely. <laughs> hey, I'll tell you what. Rabbits have as much to do with Easter as they have to do with our fucking show anyway. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's Thank fair. Thank you. So with all that to look forward to, we're going to bring episode 398 to a merciful close. Once again, a huge thanks to Anna for hanging out with us tonight, and perhaps even a huger thanks to all the Patreon donors to help make the show go. If you'd like to count yourself among their ranks, you can make a per episode donation at patreon.com slash godawful, and thereby earn early access to an ad-free version of every episode. You can also help a ton by leaving a five-star review and by sharing the show on all your various social media platforms and if you enjoyed this show be sure to check out the sibling shows the scaling atheist citation data dnd minus and the skeptocrat available wherever podcasts live if you have questions comments or cinematic suggestions you can email a cut off on movies at gmail.com tim robertson takes care of our social media our theme song was written and performed by ryan slot and google drafts on mars all the other music was written and performed by our audio engineer morgan clark and was used with permission thanks again for giving us a chunk of your life this week for heath and and eli bosnick i'm no illusions promise to work harder earn another chunk next week until then we'll leave you with a breakfast club close None of the unaborted babies since 1978 ever went on to cure cancer. But the stem cells recovered from a certain abortion would end up coming in very handy. Clayton never saw butterflies at any point in this stupid fucking movie. Why bring it up? (laughs) Josh Zach Ryan actually would have been super Hitler. See, movie? We can both do the stupid thing. Proceeding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2020.